You want me to wait? No, just, just stop. You sure? Yeah. That's all I got, huh? So, um, uh, you know, for the most part, cardiac MRI, as far as diagnosis of hypoplastic left heart or right heart, is rarely used. I mean, you have a fetus, uh, usually at that time, um, at least in the United States, it's mostly in fetal life. And if it's not in fetal life, it's really early on in neonatal life. But the question is, how can cardiac MRI help you to continue down the road after the initial diagnosis? So uh, potentially before your Glenn, and then potentially before your Fontan, and obviously more long-term after your Fontan, which uh, most of the kids get their Fontan completion by the time they're three years old, maybe four years old. So they have a pretty long length of time of living with the Fontan. How do we make sure that that single ventricle, be it a right or a left ventricle, is in good health and we keep them as much in health as possible with um, everything that we can do? So I'll show you a few of the things that um, uh, cardiac MRI can do all the way up to the Fontan position and then at the Fontan we'll really do in the next session after the hypoplastic right heart. So um, there's uh, obviously the, I said the initial diagnosis, so the pre glen MRI, the pre Fontan MRI and then the post Fontan MRI, we'll discuss that in the single ventricle session. So obviously the initial diagnosis is uh, usually um, by echo. Um, MRI is usually not, does not play a role in that, but we've, what we're learning now is that after the Norwood or stage one surgery, there's really, um, I, excuse me, before stage one surgery, there's really kind of two subtypes that can benefit from MRI. The ones with EFE or endocardial fibrillostosis, where it could be present, and that's very similar to myocardial um, characterization, and so you're going to see that, and I'll show how you can see that um, uh, in utero potentially with fetal intervention causing it, but then you can see it post in cardiac MRI. And then um, the subtype of atrial septal restriction, and um, I believe Dr. Freeberg has probably mentioned that with the fact that they can um, get quite a bit of pulmonary lymphedema, and we can do by cardiac MRI, look at the lung tissue and investigate that. So uh, the Boston group has done quite a bit of fetal intervention and um, have studied the patients after the fetal intervention by cardiac MRI, looking to see what the myocardium actually looks like afterwards. And um, we know that there's um, abnormalities, as you see here, all around, as well as abnormalities here in the myocardium itself, so abnormal myocardium. And um, uh, you can't exactly see the EFE in this one, but in this image, it's actually quite clear. So you can see the um, EFE all around the inside of the cavity. And when you speak to a surgeon about this who's operated on, they can say they can remove this EFE or um, fibrolistosis and really kind of almost peel it from the ventricle. It's a very easy sort of um, peeling mechanism that they do in, um, in the operating room. So we all know about... Um, sorry, we all know about the BT shunt versus um, Sano shunt. I think in the United States, um, most surgeons are now using the Sano shunt, um, although some of them are still continuing to do the BT shunt with the left ventricle. Obviously, if you have a hypoplastic uh, right ventricle, uh, for the most part, the BT shunt is the only one that's used. It's actually gotten to such a point that even in mainstream um, television, and I'll show you guys that next. Even in mainstream television, uh, there's enough of the question of Sano versus BT shunt that we have a lot of medical dramas in the United States. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen some of them, um, probably sent over here. But here's one that was called Grey's Anatomy, and I don't know if it made it to Europe. And um, yes, so I'll show you guys the small clip where it's a... Can you guys hear it? Where do I pull the sound check? Because oh, I can play it again. Right here? All right, we'll try it again. 
Okay, go ahead. What is the cardiopulmonary bypass? With HLHS, what else do you get besides hyperplasia of the ventricle? Stenosis or atresia of the mitral and aortic valves. Why are we using the RVPA conduit instead of the modified Blalock toxic shunt? It limits diastolic runoff. Well, oh. you've done your homework. I was on call last night. I study when I'm on call. <laughs> well, no matter what the books say, I guarantee you, you have never seen a heart this small. So I thought it was interesting that uh, it's, you know, enough of a, of a discussion about it that, you know, we don't really, uh, pediatric cardiology doesn't usually make it to the TV, so the fact that we, we made it was impressive. Here's a couple of examples of um, hypoplastic left heart uh, status post de Norwood. You can see here wh what we would call the four chamber. Obviously, that's not all four chambers. Here's the very hypoplastic left uh, ventricle and the dilated right ventricle. Same patient, here's the right ventricle. You can see the neoaorta right here, um, location of the anastomosis, and you can kind of tell that there's a um, aorta right here. I'll show better images of that in a little bit. Here's another patient, also single ventricle. You can see a right ventricle, quite a bit of tricuspid regurgitation, which, um, as you know, is uh, uh, yeah. Not so good to have. <laughs> um, here's another one where you can see that the hypoplastic left ventricle, definitely hypoplastic, nowhere near um, uh, size to, to carry much, but you can see that there is a little bit of forward flow through it and a little bit of mitral regurgitation that you see kind of at the end of the image. So here's the non-contrast MRA that I've talked about. And I'll show more of this as 3D reconstruction tomorrow. But you can see here is the, neo, the native aorta, very small. But you can see the coronary arteries coming off of it, right here and right here. You can see the anastomosis section, where you may potentially have um, some coarctation or a gradient that occurs around that. Here's the aorta down here again, and the coronary arteries. And here is really the Norwood procedure, per se, the augmentation with the pulmonary artery, the native aorta connecting sort of in a, what I call an upside down Y as it goes up to the aorta. I think this is kind of a nice, um, nice to show the surgeon, especially pre-Glenn, um, to show them if they need to go in and do anything to the arch, any augmentation to the arch if that's necessary, and also showing that how open the anastomosis is. It's a nice image that's difficult to get sometimes by echo. Here's another example of a, four, um, of a hypoplastic heart. And again, you can see there's more of a ventricle than you may have thought. And so the right ventricular ejection fraction seems to be in good position. All right. So uh, you get the hypoplastic single ventricle, the pre -glen. There was a study done out of Boston of uh, potentially doing either catheterization, which we're all used to, versus cardiac MRI. And they um, took 82 patients that were enrolled, 41 in the cardiac catheterization and 41 in the cardiac MRI. Patients were excluded if they were known to need to have an intervention done in the cath lab. So if um, they thought the coarctation was needed to be ballooned or so forth, they did not perform this. And there was uh, approximately one patient there was one patient from the cath lab and three from the cardiac MRI that had to be um, uh, crossed over. But otherwise, they did well with bidirectional Glenn, and follow-up analysis showed that uh, the time um, spent in the hospital was decreased on the group that had the cardiac MRI. The cost to the system was decreased as far as um, time in the intensive care unit as well as um, no, no um, radiation or anesthesia on some of these patients was needed. So it was found that cardiac MRI is safe and effective and um, um, relatively cost less than the um, cardiac catheterization. This hasn't been done yet for pre-Fontan, but could potentially be done as well on a pre-Fontan basis, and um, a multi-center study is currently being um, undertaken. So.
Cardiac MRI can decrease your radiation exposure if used correctly and potentially help patients not have to go to the cath lab as often. All right. I was, I was told to keep it very short. So we're going to move to the other side, talk about right hearts that are too small. There are a few of these. We're going to talk about really the two most common types. What we mean here again is that these are right heart structures that are simply inadequate to support uh, pulmonary blood flow uh, alone. <clears throat> and most commonly these are related to either inflow or outflow obstruction of the right ventricle, just like in hypoplastic left heart, either tricuspid atresia or pulmonary atresia with intact septum, which I've shown here. In either case, there is again common mixing, this time in the other direction, from right to left across the atrial septum, mixing in the left heart, uh, and then outflow uh, to the body. Pulmonary blood flow, in, uh, at least in pulmonary atresia intact septum, is ductus dependent. Uh, it can be in tricuspid atresia, depending on how much, how severe pulmonary stenosis is. Usually it's not. Usually there's an outflow uh, from the outflow chamber in a ventricular septal defect uh, that allows pulmonary blood flow. So here's a typical pulmonary atresia intact septum with too small a ventricle. See how massive hypertrophy here, very thick walls, but a tiny pea-sized ventricular chamber here. Uh, with a very small tricuspid valve. There's a little blood cyst on the tricuspid valve there, which is not, not so uncommon in young babies. There's another one up there. And here you see the outflow tract here is, is non-existent. There's no pulmonary outflow tract. This is just a blindly ending inflow part of the ventricle. There's really no infundibulum or outlet up here, no connection to a pulmonary artery. So this is the type of right ventricle in pulmonary atresia intact septum that could never uh, be used as a a pulmonary ventricle. It's tiny, there's no outflow tract, and so there's really no choice of what to do with this. The problem is that it's little ventricles like this that tend to have abnormal connections between the ventricle and the coronary arteries. Here's uh, <clears throat> an example of that. This is an older patient. Here's the aorta. This is the right uh, coronary ostium, the right coronary sinus that we've opened here. Here's the right coronary artery uh, that comes out of the sinus, and look uh, it's very thick-walled up here proximally. We'll see that again a little bit later. But there's a big cavernous uh, connection down here uh, between this right coronary uh, and the right ventricle. Here it's right there that goes up into the coronary artery. You can see this is a big sinusoid uh, in the right ventricle uh, that connects with this coronary artery. And the coronary was obstructed distal to that. Uh, and so here's the um, uh, right ventricle, tiny, small right ventricle hypertrophied in this patient with endocardial fibrosis. And you can track another sinusoid at the other end of it. Here we're just tracking it down through these sections. Um, the pathologist got hold of this heart uh, and made uh, sections out of it. But there you can track this down. And it ends up in the right coronary artery out here toward the apex of the heart. <clears throat> 
so there are a couple of sinusoids in this patient. Uh, this one that goes to the distal right and probably supplied uh, much of the right coronary distribution. And then the other end connects with the aorta and flow is just back and forth in the proximal part of the coronary artery. Now, <clears throat> we'll look again at this coronary artery. Here's the usually left coronary sinus and there's nothing coming out of the left coronary sinus. There's no, no um, left coronary there. The left coronary is actually here. It, in this case, comes from the right coronary. Uh, and there you can see the left coronary artery here coming from the right. So this is a patient with really severely compromised uh, coronary circulation in uh, pulmonary atresia and septum. Look how thick the wall of the coronary is here, uh, proximally where the, the uh, left coronary comes off. So th these are very abnormal coronary arteries. Uh, and this is the kind of thing uh, that we can see in patients with pulmonary atresia and intact septum. And the other type of hypoplastic right heart really is uh, tricuspid atresia. Here's an example of that. Here's the pulmonary artery. Here's the aorta. These are normally related great arteries. They could also be transposed. Here's uh, the foramen ovale, which opens easily from right atrium to left atrium. It's large here, usually unobstructed, although not always. There's the coronary sinus. Here's the atrial appendage, and you see there's no tricuspid valve here. There's just a uh, blindly ending floor of the right atrium, so there's no tricuspid valve in this patient. Here's the outlet chamber that supports the pulmonary artery here. It's rather small. There's no AV valve in it. It's just the infundibulum up here. There's a little connection here between this outlet chamber, which sees the pulmonary artery. Here's the pulmonary valve up here. Usually in tricuspid atresia, the pulmonary uh, valve and main pulmonary trunk are pretty good size. Here you see the branch pulmonary arteries. Sometimes the, if the ventricular septal defect is quite small, uh, th they're, then they're small. So here's our left ventricle with papillary muscles there and septal surface here, mitral to aortic continuity with the aorta here, and there's the ventricular septal defect that allows pulmonary blood flow. Now it could be that this would be transposed. You could have the pulmonary artery here and the aorta on the other, in which case there's really compromised systemic outflow. It may be ductus dependent systemic circulation in that situation, uh, and the baby would have to have an amalgamation of the aorta and pulmonary artery. Here, basically, it's just a matter of if the baby needs extra blood flow to create a shunt, or uh, if you can wait long enough to go right to a, to a bidirectional glen in situations like this. So the initial management here is uh, palliation to regulate pulmonary blood flow or systemic blood flow, either a shunt or possibly a band. Uh, <clears throat> there may be uh, patients who uh, would be suitable for, for an RV decompression. Some of the pulmonary atresia and tac septum patients, if they don't have coronary abnormalities and have an outflow tract, that might be possible, but they still may have to be staged to a Fontan operation because not all of these patients will have uh, normal development of the right ventricle. So I think we'll stop here and have our next speaker. Well, I'm on a very restricted time schedule, so I'm going to try to hurry up. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is pulmonary stenosis and atresia with intact ventricular septum. And again, I don't like to use the term hypoplastic right heart because I like to use the definition of what the problem is, what the lesion is. And the lesion is 
aortic, the pulmonary atresial severe stenosis. And this may present either as a, with a very tiny hyperplastic right ventricle, which is what you saw with what was just shown, or you can get severe pulmonary stenosis or atresia with tricuspid insufficiency in a large right ventricle. And some of those, of course, we see with Epstein's malformation. And then you can get pulmonary stenosis with a normal size ventricle. And then I'm going to also talk a little bit about the right ventricle to coronary artery communications, now called RVCACs. Now, we have done some experimental work in fetal lambs to produce pulmonary stenosis to see what happens. And we did this by banding the pulmonary artery uh, just above the pulmonary valve. And what we see when we do this is two different types of development. We see some fetuses who develop an extremely small right ventricle. And here you see one. This fetus had this procedure done at about, the term in the sheep is about 150 days gestation. And this was done at about 60 days. And then we studied the fetus at about 130 days gestation. So over that period of time, you see that there's a marked decrease in right ventricular size. And about 50 to 60% of the fetuses developed this. The others, though, had large right ventricles. And the ones who had large right ventricles were done somewhat later in gestation. And they also developed tricuspid insufficiency. So that it seems that you can have two different courses. And you see this in the human babies too. You see some who have very tiny ventricles and others who have well-developed ventricles. And it makes a di big difference in terms of what their prognosis is, obviously. Now, it's also true that in uh, observations on fetuses with pulmonary stenosis, there has been the same progression noted as with um, aortic stenosis in the human fetus, that in some of these fetuses, the right ventricle gets small as they grow, and so that's, it's, and they develop a hyperplastic right ventricle. Now, the interesting thing also is that the development of the ventricle seems to be related, in, at least in the lambs, to at the stage of gestation at which the stenosis developed. Now, when it was very early, they all developed hyperplastic right uh, ventricles, but later some did and others didn't. Now, we know, of course, the, the circulation. This is, again, another complete admixture <coughs> lesion. So that the final saturation is going to be in the fetus is going to be about 55% of all the blood going to the whole body. Um, the one important thing here is that unlike in uh, hyperplastic left heart or aortic atresia here, the left ventricle becomes the ventricle that does all the work. And it ejects the total output of the heart, when there's pre pulmonary atresia, all the blood has to be ejected by the left ventricle, and all the venous blood comes across the foramen into the left ventricle, joined by pulmonary, arterial, pulmonary venous blood from the uh, lungs, and this total volume is ejected by the left ventricle, so that the left ventricle, which normally ejects in the fetus 45%, of combined output, here it's ejecting 100%. So the left ventricle is big, its wall is thicker than normal, and because of the fact that all the blood, the total cardiac output, is ejected by the left ventricle into the ascending aorta, 
the ascending aorta is big and the aortic isthmus which normally in the in the in the fetus carries about 10% of combined ventricular output is now carrying the total combined ventricular output so that the aorta and the, uh, the ascending aorta and aortic isthmus are wide. The ductus carries only blood that goes to the lungs. It's now going left to right across the ductus to, to go to the lungs. And because of this, instead of normally the ductus carries 35 to 40 percent of blood from the pulmonary artery to the descending aorta. Here, pulmonary blood flow in the human fetus at term is about 20% of combined output. So it's only carrying about half of the blood flow that it normally carries in utero. So therefore, the ductus is small. It's also interesting that it's variable, but you see, the, as I've mentioned before, when the ductus carries blood from the aorta to the pulmonary artery, it tends to have an acute inferior angle with the descending aorta. And in these babies, you find that's true, but it's variable. It depends on probably what stage of gestation this develops. If it develops early, then it's very likely that you'll have a very marked acute angle. If it develops later, you may not. And that correlates pretty well with the size of the ventricle. So that I think that what we can predict is that if the, if the stenosis has developed early, that the ductus will be small and acutely angled. If it develops later, it will not. <coughs> now, um, let's go on. Now let's talk about right ventricular to coronary artery communications. So I said, these used to be called sinusoids, but it's now said that this term should not be used. So I've cut it out of my terminology. <laughs> but we still, we still think of it of these as sinusoids, but people say you shouldn't use that term. Now the interesting thing, uh, these are very interesting because the channels may end blindly in the right ventricular wall, but most of the time they connect with either the left anterior descending or the right coronary artery. And the, there is almost always a stenosis of the coronary artery at the site of a connection with these, with these sinusoids. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But sometimes there's no communication at all. Now, also, you find them when there's pulmonary atresia with an intact ventricular septum, when the ventricle is small. You do not find them when the ventricle is big. So it seems as if they occur only when the pulmonary stenosis or atresia has developed early, at a time before the, the coronary circulation, which normally develops within the muscle and later connects with the main coronary artery, so it appears as if they have developed before these connections are made and probably very early during the development of the pulmonary stenosis or atresia. Uh, now, it's really very interesting because a great deal of attention has been paid to these uh, connections. And the concept has been held that they may be important in providing blood to the flow to the coronary circulation. Because here you have a situation where either the coronary artery connection to these, uh, these connections is, is uh, poor, or you may have a problem then, how do you get blood flow to the coronary circulation, to the muscle? So it's been said that you should try to retain the pressure in the right ventricle 
in order to provide coronary circulation. So that a number of surgical procedures have been developed to try to, to, try to avoid reducing the pressure in the right ventricle in order to provide coronary blood flow because it's thought, it was thought that these vessels provide blood flow to the coronary circulation. I think that's nonsense, because if you think about it, during the time when the ventricles are contracting, the muscle is also contracting, so there's not much flow. And we know normally coronary blood flow during systole is minimal. There's no very little coronary blood flow going into the, the coronary circulation. All the coronary blood flow occurs during diastole. So that saying that these provide blood flow to the coronary circulation just doesn't make sense. But the one other important question that comes up with these vessels is this one. And that is... Uh, I'm going the wrong way. I don't miss it. Well, the the issue is the the concept has been raised now that it's possible that these connections, sinusoids create a runoff from the coronary arteries. And it has been thought that when you have a coronary circulation during diastole, if there is a connection to the, from the, ma the major, major coronary arteries to these, quote, sinusoids, that during diastole, when the pressure in the right ventricle is low, that instead of perfusing the muscle, that the, there will be a steal from the coronary arteries into the right ventricular cavity. So this has been thought to be a possible problem in causing difficulty with right ventricular function and left ventricular function too because of the steel. And because of that, people have developed procedures to thrombose the right ventricle in order to avoid this runoff from these sinusoids into the, into the right ventricle cavity. However, it's more likely there, some, there are several <coughs> studies now which have shown that it's very common to have stenosis at the junction of these sinusoids with the coronary vessels. And that seems to be the major problem, that there's very little likelihood that uh, these vessels are either perfusing the lung or that there is a big steel. So that it seems as if the problems of coronary perfusion are related to local stenosis at the junction of these vessels. You know, I think I'm going to stop there because of the time factor. Hey, just before you sit down and take the microphone off, um, I wonder whether you would just uh, uh, talk a little bit about the right ventricular dependent coronaries rather than the sinusoids. Uh, would you make a comment about the th what happens when the proximal coronary artery is missing and the right ventricle is that that's perfusing the coronary circulation? I don't know much about that. I can't really, I don't, I haven't thought much about it, Norman, okay. so I can't say. All right. Hey, you're talking about a, a shunt procedure? When you did ventricular, yeah, yeah. You make mistakes. <laughs>
Yeah, no, I, I, I think I, I wanted to just uh, enlarge on that because I, I have something to say about it. Um, I hope. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Three minutes? Three, three minutes? All right. I'm not quite sure which one of these fingers you're holding up at me. Fifteen. Oh, fifteen minutes. Fifteen. Like, you mean that? Okay. So, um, um, I'll just uh, talk about a little bit about the ultrasound and some of the other findings. Um, so we measure the, um, one of the big things about making a determination about hyperplastic uh, right ventricle, and uh, Dr. Rudolph, I'll let you call them sinusoids if you let me call it hyperplastic left heart syndrome. How's that for a deal? <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, when we look at uh, this condition, people have looked at the tricuspid annulus as a reflection of right ventricular size, and so the ratios or the size or the z-scores of the tricuspid valve have been established uh, to uh, look at see whether uh, one can actually incorporate the right ventricle as part of a two ventricle or one and a half ventricle repair. And of course, how do you measure the right ventricular size uh, other than using tricuspid z-scores and uh, right and left ventricular measurements? So here is um, the Z-score data, which was published by Frank Hanley. And um, so you look at the uh, dimension of uh, the valve and the body surface area, and you get a, a, a relationship, and you, you can move them from one to the other. So um, here's the body surface area, and here's the measurement of the ventricle. And that's uh, if the body surface area was 0.3, it would be a z-score of minus one and a half, but if the body surface area was four on that z-score, it would be a z of minus three, and the cutoff point for including a ventricle is minus two and a half. So you can see that actually the, as v for very little difference in measurement, it becomes very critical as to whether it's a two and a half or the three. And the, the thing that we've observed in all of these measurements where you get a linear relationship for example, even with, the, with colon's scores, is that it's very easy when it's down here and you know what's going on, and up there, and it makes a linear relationship. But in the middle where you have to make a decision, it's very, very hard, and I think this is exactly uh, the situation. Now, Dr. Minnick and her colleagues didn't use these scores. They used a comparative ratio between right and left ventricular uh, size, and when this was under half... Uh, this would uh, indicate that it would be a failure of the uh, two ventricle repair. So what do they look like? Well, we can look and how do we estimate right ventricular size? I think you can see Dr. Rudolph would want me to show you that with atrial contraction, right atrial pressure is elevated, and so with each atrial contraction, the atrial septum bulges into the left ventricle. And this is a, a small but not uh, inadequate right ventricle. Look at the tricuspid valve. It's small and non-motile uh, for obvious reasons. So um, many, many years ago, uh, my German colleague Klaus Schmidt and I looked at planimetering. I've done a lot of planimetering in my time. The uh, areas of the ventricles rather than just looking at tricuspid score. And if we found uh, it was less than 0.45, it was not favorable for a tricuspid a two ventricle repair. Now, uh, we can measure volumes of the ventricles. So this uh, data actually comes from a work that was established by Dr. Sanders uh, and Dr. I think it's Azaria Ryan who did volumes of the right ventricle. And you can use the Simpsons rule. Eckhart, Eckhart, Trovich, sorry. Um, uh, that's correct. Um, uh, and uh, you can get some estimate of the size of the ventricles. And uh, why is it important? Uh, I'll, I think I'll show you in a moment. You can enhance the area or the volume of the ventricle by using uh, color flow methods to get a reasonable 
assessment of the actual size of the ventricle. And, um, oh, there we go. Now, um, there was work done by Dr. Julian Hoffman, a colleague of mine, about uh, working on hyperplastic left heart as to, he did a meta-analysis to see whether patients uh, were survived or whether they died based on the size of their ventricles. And in actual fact, there was a critical cutoff at about 20 mil per meter squared, which I think has been already cited. Uh, but he went even further then and looked at ejection fraction uh, and uh, calculated the uh, size of the ventricles and what was really necessary. And now, basically, if you have 20 mil per meter squared of body surface area and you're a neonate and you have a heart rate of 100, you get about a 2 liter um, volume, and if you have a 50% ejection fraction, you get one liter per minute per meter squared of flow across the valve. So I think that um, you can sort of use this as an extrapolate, as a different and additional method of looking at the ventricles, and it's really amazing when you see a ventricle that's got a volume basically of two mil mils, and really basically uh, the baby's got a body surface area of 0.2, that's 10 mil per meter squared, that, that ventricle will never make it as part of a two ventricle repair. So what are the indicators for excluding the right ventricle from the circulation? Well, certainly if there's a lot of infundibular hyperplasia, um, uh, that's one of the exclusions. And then sinusoids, which is much easier to write than ventricular coronary connections. I'm going to start using this as a protest now, call them sinusoids. Endocardial fibroelastosis, which is not actually that common in uh, this condition, and also papillary muscle fibrosis and of, of obviously poor ventricular function. But when you've got an obstruction across the ventricle, the vent doesn't matter how good the intrinsic myocardial contraction is, if the ventricle can't empty, it can't squeeze. So here is uh, such an example which I've matched up with two um, pathological examples here, and you can see here is a very uh, nicely developed pulmonary valve which is not moving. This is a baby with a, um, a, a intact septum and pulmonary atresia. And you can see how the infundibulum is hypoplastic here. Contrast this to something even that has happened here. This is an autopsy specimen, quite obviously. Um, the heart's not moving. Uh, but you can see very nicely the uh, pulmonary um, valvar area. But there's collapse of this infundibulum here. There's, although there's endothelium uh, that is present, this uh, ventricle is really... Um, uh, doesn't have an, a, an infundibular connection to it. This one uh, still does, and probably is much more akin to what we see here. But certainly this is very critical because it doesn't really matter what happens uh, when you perforate this valve. If there's going to be a lot of obstruction over there, it's uh, pretty useless as to what you're getting. And we know from the nature of this ventricular hypertrophy that this isn't an area that tends to relax very easily and contracts substantially in systole. So infundibular stenosis is certainly a problem, and if you don't like that picture, here's a picture in the um, orthogonal plane. There's, you see very nice pulmonary valve leaf, leaflets. They aren't moving, and you see this total collapse of the right ventricular outflow tract in systole. Uh, and it can get worse. Here's a hypertrophy of the uh, septoparietal and uh, septomarginal trabeculations with, uh, a, again, uh, pulmonary atresia and a very small ventricle. Now, what about these uh, sinusoids? Uh, and here's a, a look at sinusoids. And I think, uh, again, I would say that uh, you have to lower the Nyquist limit to see these. Uh, this is actually the same patient. Uh, this is just the angiogram done in this very patient. Um, uh, David Title did these, I did these. Um, and you can see um, these uh, were very well-developed sinusoids with the flow retrograde coming out of uh, the ventricle and extending uh, from the inferior surface into the right ventricle and from the uh, septal surface uh, into the uh, not right ventricle, right coronary and left coronary artery. And more importantly, as Dr. Rudolph had mentioned, uh, let me just show you uh, on this uh, section over here 
that here is a sinusoid, here is the ventricular surface right up at the top of the slide, here is the thickness of the myocardium, and here's the sinusoid entering the coronary artery. And I'd like to just point out to you this abnormal musculature which is present within the um, proximal part of the coronary artery, and certainly in this condition the coronary arteries can be considered to be quite abnormal. Okay, if you didn't like that picture, here's a moving picture uh, that shows these sinusoids. And uh, that's really sinusoids in, and of themselves are not that important. Um, what I do believe is important, and one of the reasons why we catheterize these patients, I think, is because of this condition. This is actually an 18-week fetus uh, that we recognized in utero with very high velocity flow coming out of the coronary artery. I didn't actually put the Doppler on here because we're not talking fetal echocardiography. But you can see here is the aorta, and the proximal coronary artery is missing here. And so this is a, a ventricular-dependent coronary artery over here. And certainly uh, this is the kind of uh, coronary artery, as you see over here, where the um, actual perfusion of the myocardium is achieved from the right ventricular cavity. And so that obviously is a very uh, difficult condition. I'll show you other pictures of that here in a moment. So you can see the coronary with the arrows highlighted over there. And here is another such example. Um, sometimes things don't move when I say they should. So here you see um, this abnormal bulge on the surface of the heart with a... Uh, a connection through this coronary artery and then perfusing back into the aorta. So ventricular coronary connections can be particularly bad and you can understand in patients like this, and we've done this, unfortunately, even if you do a shunt, you then act again as a steel from perfusing that coronary artery and the patients do very poorly. So these may well be ed ab initio patients who should be considered for heart transplantation. It, it moves as uh, Galileo once said. So, now uh, for Dr. Rudolph, um, here we go uh, looking at the Doppler flow signal within the coronary artery circulation. And so, you can recognize systole here, okay? And uh, this is a sort of a subcostal view which is very poorly demonstrated here. So, in systole, uh, the flow is going uh, out of the ventricle and into the coronary artery, and in diastole, it's perfusing back into the aorta. And I'll point out to you that the diastolic filling is really quite poor in these ventricles. So there really is a compromise in terms of a, a perfusion of, of, of these ventricles. And here is such a fetus uh, with a massive coronary perfusion. Uh, you can see this in utero. Um, uh, this was a lady who came to us from the Cameroon to study nursing, but she came pregnant, and uh, she was going to have her baby in the United States, as many uh, foreign people tend to want to do, so that the child can get citizenship. Uh, but uh, unfortunately had this condition associated with pulmonary atresia. Here is the Doppler flow signal in utero, uh, of, of, of this flow showing uh, perfusion out. Obviously, there's no ECG here because it's a fetus. Uh, perfusion um, out of the ventricle uh, in systole and forward flow in diastole. Oh, sorry, it's the other way around. This is perf uh, squeeze out and then forward flow in diastole. And here is an example of this ventricle, and here is this sinusoid running through the myocardium onto the anterior surface and up the right coronary artery and into the aorta. So, sin... Ab always. No, it doesn't show anything that's going to the muscle. It shows what's coming out, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, now I'm, I'm afraid I still can't perf uh, do perfusion studies of the myocardium with ultrasound. Uh, but anyway... Um, so I don't want to belabor this anymore, but you can see certainly the flow coming out of these sinusoids and going into the coronary arteries. And this is the angiogram that was done in this patient, and you can see that the coronary artery is perfused totally retrograde from this, um, uh, this sinusoid. So uh, unfortunately, uh, the choices here 
were quite limited because this woman was going to go back to the Cameroon with this baby and we didn't think heart transplant was advisable. And so we elected to do the next best thing, which was a shunt. And unfortunately, the child succumbed shortly after the uh, shunt had been completed. Well, we talked about pulmonary atresia, and uh, Dr. Rudolph didn't like the term hypoplastic left ventricle because uh, just as somebody once said about the Holy Roman Empire, it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. And so we can say about pulmonary atresia with hypoplastic right ventricle that sometimes uh, the right ventricle is not hypoplastic. In fact, it may be enlarged and dilated, and that is a separate subtype of uh, pulmonary atresia intact septum that has a sort of a much worse prognosis. I don't know why. They don't seem to have sinusoids, although uh, there is a, an association between size and sinusoids. It is not uniform. And there are some wonderful pictures in Bob Friedem's book on angiography where he'll show you a large ventricle that still has sinusoids. So uh, not everything is absolutely black and white in medicine. As one of my teachers told me, there's never and never and never and always in medicine. So uh, here's a patient who's got a lot of tricuspid regurgitation. It almost looks like the regurgitation is coming from a low valve. It's not a low valve, it's just that the acceleration begins somewhat below the valve and ejects into the atrium. And so uh, these patients have a, uh, a very... Uh, a, a, a worse prognosis with, with the size of the ventricle. When we looked at the duct here, we sort of see uh, the flow coming from the arterial duct, bouncing off this, this atretic pulmonary valve, and then coming in almost a laminar flow back into the pulmonary artery. And, of course, you can always see in uh, pulmonary atresia that, uh, for some remarkable reason, they almost all have... Uh, um, evidence of raphes that uh, suggest where the uh, sinuses of Valsalva were, which is different from uh, the uh, aortic atresias. And here, at the time of a perforation with the radiofrequency wire in a patient with pulmonary atresia, you can uh, see these things on echocardiogram. And I just show this the same sort of feature again with the uh, pulmonary atresia showing the origins of the sinus valsalva and a little area in the center here that says place a radiofrequency catheter here. So, you know, I think that they are different conditions, uh, but certainly uh, they require a lot of care echocardiographically to differentiate between critical pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary retresia. This is the last slide, Matthias. Thank you. Um, I'll take 10 minutes to describe the slide. But uh, <laughs> this uh, here, you see very nicely the um, sort of looks like a tretic pulmonary valve, but the valve leaflets are actually opening and closing. And I think that you have to be very careful and look at things like uh, the, um, the uh, flow coming across the valve. And indeed, there is some flow coming backwards across the valve. And as Dr. Shirali had mentioned, earlier, you know, once you see a valve, when you see flow going the wrong way across it, you can assume that it must be patent. So uh, this is a whole different prognosis, although the ventricles are sort of similar in a way, uh, they seem to be uh, different uh, clinical conditions. And so for football season, I'll just say to you, thank you very much for listening to me. Dr. Shirali is coming up now. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, let me put that down. No, no. Sorry. It's me. I'll do it for you. No, I'll do this. I'll put this on here. Hold him up. It is a shirt. I know. Okay. All right. Okay, it's fine. Okay.
Okay. All right. So um, I uh, uh, my my time allotment on the prior session went down to minus twenty minutes, and so so I wasn't able to speak. But now now that I got the podium, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go away now. So uh, uh, so I have a few things that I thought I wanted to talk about that deal with patients with single ventricles. It doesn't matter whether they are hypoplastic left heart syndromes or hypoplastic right heart syndromes or or, or what kind of uh, single ventricle patients they are. Um, the first one is, uh, uh, I thought I should make a point about uh, uh, volumetrics uh, of the ventricles uh, that are done by 3D echo. Uh, the second point was uh, not a 3D point, but it is a interesting little question for, for people to think about with the Sano versus the BT shunt. And then the third one is uh, I'm going to show you some 3D images because, uh, because that's what I'm paid to do. I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, so in terms of volumetrics, um, uh, when we look at uh, LV volumetrics for small left ventricles, so whether that's a s appropriate size left ventricle in a child or whether it's a s hypoplastic left ventricle in somebody with a hypoplastic left ventricle, uh, this guy, Mark Friedberg, published this thing a couple of years ago where he looked at uh, MRI validation of the volumes and masses of these and the EFs of these small ventricles compared to, you know, so it's just sort of 3D echo uh, using the matrix technology, compared that to, uh, compared that to MRI, um, and found, uh, found that it worked pretty well. So I don't think that that's that much of a question anymore. And certainly the accuracy of 3D echo for LV volumetrics has been established in adults uh, for quite a while now. There are issues with the right ventricle, and I'm going to go over them a little bit with you without showing any pictures. Uh, the first issue is that there was literature that came out up until about three or four years ago that showed good validation, good correlation between the volumes of the ventricle of the RV by MRI compared to, uh, of, by 3D echo compared to MRI. The problem is there's only one company that makes the software to do RV volumetrics. And they um, had a, a product that looked kind of it, it worked kind of like MRI does. It did method of disks, you know, method of disks. Sort of, that's sort of what it did. Um, a few years ago, three or four years ago, they decided to become more advanced. And they developed something that is supposed to be very automated. The problem with the automated thing is that it requires that you have equal sized RVs and LVs. And for doing RV volumetrics, it asks you to point out where the mitral valve is and where the LV apex is. And if the LV apex is not adjacent to the RV apex, and if the mitral valve is not adjacent to the tricuspid valve, then the software doesn't work very well. In fact, it kind of doesn't work well, so, or work. And so, the, so, so this made the, what, what, you know, this is sometimes, I, I say the enemy of good is better. You know, if they had something good, they tried to make something better and it failed. So now, th later this year, it's a German company, so any of you who has any influence, feel free to talk to them. Uh, Tom Tech. So they're supposed to be trying to come up with this new thing now that goes back to the way that it used to be done before. Uh, but, uh, but until that gets figured out, I'm not going to be recommending RV volumetrics. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was the Sano shunt and RV mechanics. Mark, this one's for you, all right? So I would, I would put it to you that the Sano shunt is a, leads to a very unique form of double outlet right ventricle. It's an iatrogenic double outlet right ventricle, right? So let's think about this now. You have one ventricle that is coupled to two separate vascular beds. So you've got ventricular vascular connections of two different kinds at the same time. One of them, hopefully, is wide open going to the body. The other one is hopefully a restrictive kind of a shunt that's going out to a low resistance circuit out peripherally. You with me? OK. So the higher resistance one has a valve. The lower resistance one doesn't have a valve. All good so far. So the interesting thing with this is if you put Doppler inside the uh, outflows, you're, you're going to get two different ejection patterns. There's no doubt about it, right? Um, so just some assumptions for you, OK? So let's say that the RV pressure is a systolic of about 70. And let's say the diastolic is you know, between 0 and 7. Let's say it's 7. And let's say that your blood pressure is 70 over 30. And let's say that your pulmonary artery pressure, distal to the shunt, so out in the PAs, 
is about 15 over 5. Everybody good so far? Those are all reasonable numbers, right? OK. So now what, what would happen is your RV is going to eject to the body as long as your RV pressure is greater than 30. Because that's the pressure in the, in the you know, that's a diastolic, systemic diastolic pressure. So if you remember the pressure volume loop, the moment the ventricular pressure exceeds the diastolic, systemic diastolic pressure, the semilunar valve should open or stay open, or it stays open until that point, and there's ejection into that structure. All good? But the RV will eject into the shunt as long as RV pressure is greater than 5 because, or as long as the PA pressure is greater than 5 because, you know, because those are the numbers in the PA. So you're going to have two different uh, patterns. So how is that going to look? It's going to look like something that we call a fluid dipole. Uh, this is something, I talked about this with sort of fluid engineer people in, uh, um, uh, in Charleston and so on. And the concept of the fluid dipole is that you have no moving parts. It's the most simple form of, um, of, a, of a valve, if you will, where pressure gradients favor prograde flow into the shunt. Um, and it therefore functions almost like a valve because of directional pressure gradients. Because in diastole, there is very little impetus for, for the regurgitant uh, flow back from the PAs into the Sanu shunt. And that maybe explains why the Sanu shunt is less regurgitant than we would expect. So we did a study at, uh, at MUSC where what we did was old-fashioned phonocardiograms were put on the chil children's chests. And we, um, we, we did uh, Doppler studies uh, with this. Unfortunately, the fellow who um, worked with me on this was not a Mark Friedberg, and so we never published this study. But, uh, but I can, I'll show you a picture from it, which I think is really just terrific. And it shows that there is no measurable isovolumic contraction phase for the ventricle, and there's no measurable isovolumic relaxation phase for the ventricle at all. What, in other words, when you put Doppler through the Sano shunt, you're going to get continuously either prograde flow or regurgitant flow and nothing else. There's no time there between those two things. Okay? In fact, um, you'll see both things together. And if you put this, the uh, phono on there, you find that in almost all patients, flow into the Sano shunt starts before the first heart sound. So before the tricuspid valve even closes, there's prograde flow into the, into the Sano shunt. Okay? And S2, which is the neo-aortic valve closure, that closure occurs and flow continues beyond that. So this is a very crazy ventricle now because it's doing all of that into the lungs, but it's doing appropriate ejection, we think, into the body. So this ventricle is not able to build energy the way that ventricles do with, um, uh, with, with, the, with isovolumic phases until, until stage two happens. And then the question becomes, so for the first four to six months, this ventricle has been exposed to this very abnormal pressure volume loop, which is almost like a triangle. And then all of a sudden, we impose, we take away the Sano shunt, and we put, uh, you know, we put tension on the ventricle. We start to make it do isovolumic work. So how is it going to react to that? So this is the trace that I wanted to show you. This is the first heart sound here. That's the second heart sound there. This is regurgitant flow, and that's prograde flow. So you'll see, this is S1. So I'm going to draw a line. S1 would start, S1 times about there. Ejection into the Sano shunt starts before S1. Yeah? And uh, no surprise, regurgitation or ejection into the Sano continues beyond S1. So there's a very, very short, and then if you do time velocity integrals on these two things, it's about a 6 to 1 ratio for prograde to regurgitant um, flow. All right? Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop by asking these questions. The Tay index, isovolumic acceleration slope, and other Doppler indices, what do they really mean when you've got an RV that has two different ejection times, two different um, you know, they're simultaneous, but they're not quite simultaneous. One is shorter, one is longer. You could argue that one is not as important, but it's the one that supplies pulmonary blood flow. So think about it. Um, so what we've kind of come up with is that the flow from the RV into the Sano occurs independent of systole or diastole. It's really all about pressure gradients. It's just a fascinating kind of a thing. So anyway, um, I've, I've received my uh, flag, and so I probably am going to be a good citizen and leave. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, so um, in the small uh, RV, I'm going to talk about polyatresia uh, intact septum. And just as I said for a hypoplastic left heart syndrome, it's almost shocking how little true functional data we have on these hearts um, because we know they have problems and we know they do poorly. So uh, I'm going to skip the uh, general considerations because I think that um, uh, the previous speakers uh, covered them. I just want to emphasize out of all of these things which we talked about, uh, that beyond the hypertrophy, people have found evidence for myocardial fiber disarray. And uh, Norman talked about the endocardial fibrolistosis and fibrosis. Uh, and uh, I'll come back to left ventricular myocardial dysfunction as well, but it's also true that maybe there are very few studies and maybe it's difficult to talk because of the heterogeneity among patients, something that's true for almost all congenital heart disease. I was going to give Norman this tribute, Norman this tribute, I was going to, but you gave yourself the tribute uh, in establishing a function uh, with your study with Klaus Schmidt, but what you uh, didn't say, and this was looking at uh, echo versus angio, was... Uh, in these nice correlations was that there was a reduction, as you might expect, uh, after opening up the valve. And this, uh, in, in, in your study, interestingly, was possibly the reason that, pe that these patients were not able to come of prostaglandins because the right ventricle even decreased their volume. Not only did they not increase their volume, and I think we still struggle with those patients, but that doesn't really have to do with function, so I'm not going to go uh, into that. Uh, and we hope that they continue to grow afterwards, but we all know the impatience of the, the ne neonates sitting in the uh, NICU on prostaglandin at about three weeks, and this is 19 days in your study, and everyone wants to put in a shunt and not wait the extra week or two or whatever it is. Um, and we say that the right ventricle has to melt away and the hypertrophy has to regress. Anyway, so when people started doing tissue Doppler for right ventricular function, because it initially didn't come out uh, or wasn't published for right ventricular function, this is work of the Frommelts, but others came out as well, then people started thinking, well, can we use this for different uh, right ventricular conditions? And almost all the work was done in Tetralogy of Fellow, as I showed you yesterday. So there are very few studies uh, on this condition, palmiotresia intact septum. This is work uh, from uh, YF Chung's group in Hong Kong, who's done also very good work in the area of function and myocardial uh, performance. And uh, both tissue velocities up here on the top and strain rate here at the bottom. And this is all systole. The next slide will be diastole. And he looked, and these are patients uh, who are already around 12 years old or so and underwent biventricular repair. So we're talking about the good end of the spectrum those patients that did manage to undergo bioventricular repair, not the ones with severe sinusoids, et cetera. And look at this. No one is shocked here to see that they have decreased right ventricular tissue velocities and strain rate. But if you look at the left ventricle and the patients are the black and the controls are the, uh, uh, the open bars or the white, you can see that the left ventricle also has significantly decreased tissue velocities and strain rate. Here is diastole, and I said to you it's almost never restricted to one phase or the other. And I think uh, Dr. Shirali just showed you how we don't even know where systole starts and diastole uh, ends often. It depends what you call which, by which definition. But you can see that diastole is also uh, abnormal in the right and left ventricles over here. And the early diastolic strain rate is certainly reduced. Now this paper, also from the same group in Hong Kong, uh, knew that there was fibro or fibrous changes in these ventricles and looked at this issue and we pointed out right ventricular restric restrictive physiology, which they diagnosed with Doppler. Do you remember the end diastolic forward flow after the A wave in the right ventricle? That's how they diagnosed it. And in fact, out of their pretty large group, you know, 54 patients, about, um, sorry, 27 patients versus 27 controls, most of these had restrictive RV physiology, so uh, that these ventricles seem to be uh, restrictive. <clears throat> and what was interesting to me, that in the restrictive group, their right ventricular systolic strain was reduced. So we define the population by supposedly a diastolic abnormality, and then they have reduced systolic strain. And again, relatively well patients, uh, 
actually the, the right ventricular uh, early diastolic strain rate was also reduced, but not the late diastolic strain rate. And this is, they used echo and MRI, echo to diagnose the uh, RV uh, uh, antegrade flow, the, the restrictive physiology, and they showed the right ventricular fibrosis uh, with late gadolinium enhancement, not shown in this picture, but in their article, they also showed patchy left ventricular uh, fibrosis in some patients, perhaps explaining uh, the uh, abnormalities in left ventricular uh, strain. Now, this is a, a, an interesting slide, because if you look here, the right ventricular uh, 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 late gadolinium enhancement score was related with the early diastolic strain rate. The worse the score, the lower the strain rate. So you'll say, yeah, okay, so that's worse. But the late gadolinium enhancement rate was, uh, uh, the opposite correlation was found with exercise capability. And that I'm less able to explain. So the more fibrosis they had, the better they were able to exercise. I know it's not a very tight correlation. You can say it's a small study. It's a heterogeneous population. They explain it by perhaps favorable ventricular interactions, meaning your smaller, you know, not dilated RVs, as I showed you with other um, lesions that we spoke about. Perhaps that doesn't impact the left ventricular function as much. I'm not sure that that's the explanation at all, but that's the result they found. We don't have much other literature uh, to go by. And then I just wanted to bring this one um, a study showing the opposite, that if you have decreased ventricular function uh, on just conventional echo, and if you have tricuspid regurgitation, you do have decreased exercise tolerance. I, w I won't go into the actual numbers. That's what, just what the slides says. So uh, those were the few slides I had on that uh, condition. Uh, it's a baffling condition, and we certainly need more studies on the function of both ventricles.